So, the Mustang Prince has increased his COVID immunity by getting his second booster. No thanks to those wretched Pfizer scumbags. But what's even worse is that his 32nd year of life is just around the corner. Ugh, what must I do to prevent him from getting in my way? Ugh, think, Welder, think. Ugh, well, I better see what his majesty is blogging now. Hi, everybody. Glad you can make it. I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oro Reports. You know, for many years now, I've been hoping that one day that I would talk about the oldest cartoon icon ever made on my blog series. Years ago, before characters like Mickey Mouse, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Bugs Bunny, or even Astro Boy were ever made, there was a character named Felix the Cat. Yep, hard to believe, huh? But anyway, for those who may not be familiar with Felix, please let me tell you a little bit of his history. Created in 1919 by Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer during the silent film era, Felix was one of the most recognized cartoon characters in film history. Aside from his animated shorts, Felix starred in a comic strip beginning in 1923, and his image soon adored merchandise such as ceramics, toys, and postcards. Jazz bands such as Paul Whiteman's played songs about him like 1923's Felix Kept on Walking and many others. In 1926, Felix became the first high school mascot for the Logan Sport Indiana Berries. By the late 1920s, with the arrival of sound cartoons, Felix's success was sadly fading due to the popularity of the new Disney shorts of Mickey Mouse, which made the silent offerings of Sullivan and Mesmer seem outdated. In 1929, Sullivan decided to make the transition and began distributing Felix sound cartoons through Copley Pictures. However, the sound Felix shorts proved to be a failure and the operation sadly ended in 1932. But then in 1953, Felix's cartoons began airing on American television with Joe Oriolo introducing a redesigned Felix with longer legs, a much smaller body, and a larger, rounder head with no whiskers and no teeth. Oriolo also added new characters and gave Felix a magic bag of tricks that could assume an infinite variety of shapes on Felix's behest. As of the 2010s, Felix is featured on a variety of merchandise from clothing to toys. Joe's son, Don Oriolo, later assumed creative control of Felix. In 2002, TV Guide ranked Felix the Cat at number 28 on its 50 greatest cartoon characters of all time list. And in 2014, Don Oriolo sold the rights of the character to DreamWorks Animation, which is now part of Comcast's NBC Universal division via Universal Pictures. Now, as a kid, I sadly never watched Felix's 1953 animated series due to the fact that I never knew which channel it was on at the time. However, I did only watch one VHS which featured three episodes from the twisted tales of Felix the Cat. But a few years before that, I managed to see a movie on the Disney Channel during the mid-1990s, which introduced me to the legendary cartoon Cat. And of course, that's the movie that I'll be blogging today. Released a home video in the United States on August 23rd, 1991, this is Felix the Cat the movie. And now, on for the plot of the movie. In another dimension, the villainous scientist, the Duke of Zill, with the help of his mechanical geometric army, takes over the land of Oriana and takes his innocent niece prisoner, prompting Felix the Cat, followed by the Professor and Point Dexter, and a few new friends to save the princess and restore order once again. And 
that's basically the whole plot in a nutshell. So, what are my thoughts on this movie? Well, despite a few flaws, ever since I saw the movie on the Disney Channel, I consider this movie a cult favorite, and I had a lot of fun watching it, even if I never owned it on VHS during my childhood. And it literally took me until my high school age to watch it again on YouTube. And after recently watching it again, I still enjoy it. And to further explain why I still love it, let's head over to Mustang Notes. The film began development in the late 1980s when Don Oriello began working on a feature-length television special intended as a pilot. After Oriolo took the project to Europe, it ended up with late director Tibor Hernadi and his Hungarian crew at the cost of 9 million US dollars. The animation was produced at Panoya Film Studio in Hungary, with some parts subcontracted to studios in Poland and Bulgaria. New World Pictures picked up the film in May 1987 and it premiered at the Wadsworth Theater in Los Angeles in January 1989 as the opening selection of the third Los Angeles Animation Celebration. Originally slated for a Thanksgiving 1988 release, it was pushed to November 18, 1990 before New World shelved the film altogether due to financial issues. Finally, the movie got its American home video release on August 23, 1991. Now, before I continue, I must mention that the only person whom I know about who previously reviewed this movie before me was the cartoon hero back in September 2012. And believe it or not, it was his 100th episode at the time. And... I really feel bad that Eli didn't enjoy this film as much as I did. Anyway, despite the movie's troubled history and the fact that I've never watched any episodes from Felix's 1953 animated series, I think this movie has a very bizarre and adventurous feel to it, since this movie is mainly set in the land of Oriana, which is another dimension conquered by the evil Duke of Zill. To me, this magical and technological advanced world is way different from Earth. It has a strange forest, such as the Hare Forest, amazing countries such as both the wondrous Kingdom of Oriana and the perilous Land of Zill, and vast landscapes with strange creatures such as the Vicious Headhunters. And it's also inhabited by its two main races, the human-like Orianans and the animal-like zillions. The only way to get to Oriana from Earth is to use the Demence Porter, which is hidden in the Great Onero Gold Mine, which is actually Oriana spelled backwards. So, I guess you can say that this movie was pretty much my introduction to dimensional travel before I ever saw movies like Stargate and other films like that. As for the animation, well, considering that this is a film based on a classic cartoon, I think the hand-drawn animation looks pretty good for the time, even if some parts can be a bit rushed, as well as silly, random, or unnecessary at times. Plus, at the beginning of the movie, it opens with an introductional monologue by Felix, who is rendered in CGI using the then-new motion capture technology, which also appears throughout the end credits. Now, over the past many years, I've been hearing that several people have been having issues with Felix's CGI head. But to be quite honest, folks, when I saw it on TV, when I was about, uh, six, seven, eight, ugh, I, I can't remember how old I was back then, but my point is, I actually didn't mind. In fact, I thought it looked kind of cute. Also, despite the fact that we don't see too much of Princess Oriana's kingdom, I think the land of Zill that Felix accidentally stumbles into after a certain watery accident is pretty dangerous and a very forbidding looking country with all sorts of creepy places and nightmarish dangers. 
Plus, there's also the Fantastic Circus, owned by Wack Lazardi, which is where Felix and Princess Oriana are being held prisoner, along with a dank swamp. And there's Progress City, which just happens to be the land's only city that is technologically advanced, where the Duke's cylinders and cubes are manufactured. Also, I think the songs featured in this movie are pretty underrated. However, I only want to talk about three of them. First, there's Sly as a Fox, which is sung while Felix is being chased by a family of foxes during the beginning of the movie. In my eyes, well, this song is pretty much... I think it has a pretty catchy rhythm, and I think it's the kind of song that my pal Sean Burgos would like, since foxes are his favorite animal, by the way. Next, there's the Mizzard Shuffle, which is a tap dancing number performed by the Mizzards, a mix of mice and lizards. And in my opinion, this dance has a very nice, soft rhythm to it, and I think it's pretty comical at times. Finally, we come to the movie's villain song, Who is the Boss, performed by Wax Cat Band. To me, this song would have to be my favorite in the entire movie. I'm serious, folks. This song is absolutely awesome. Not only does it have such a great rock and roll beat, but it kind of seems reminiscent to songs like Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians due to it not being sung by the villain and Killer Queen from We Will Rock You. Plus, I kind of like that the spectators get to sing along too. And now, let's move on to the characters and their voice actors. Our hero, Felix the Cat, is voiced by David Colan. To me, while Felix can be very mischievous, I think he's very good-hearted and willing to help others in need. During the movie, Felix has been chosen by Princess Oriana to help her save her kingdom from her evil uncle. By the way, ever since I started re-watching this movie on YouTube, I felt that David Cullen's voice acting as Felix is almost pretty reminiscent to Mickey Mouse and Pico the Woodworm from The Magic Voyage. Plus, I think Felix's courage and loyalty kind of makes me think of Horton the Elephant from the Dr. Seuss universe. And I think the things that Felix does with his magic bag is very zany, clever, and crafty. My favorites being the part where he plays a saxophone to conjure up bubbles in order to fly away and escape from Wax Circus, and when he defeats the Headhunter tribe with hats. Next we have Felix's arch nemesis, the Professor, and his nephew Poindexter, voiced by Chris Phillips and Alice Platon whom also voiced Minister Grumper and Madam Pearl. The professor is an old scientist who may be a bit weird and insane, but he's not always an outright malicious individual. He just sees Felix as a source of constant fascination due to his obsession with his magic bag of tricks, while Poindexter is a young genius who has a very high IQ. To me, like Boris and Natasha, or Jesse and James, The Professor and Poindexter aren't really the most threatening of cartoon villains. They're more like the kind whom everybody doesn't take very seriously. Anyway, throughout this movie, The Professor and Poindexter are seen spying and pursuing Felix, and they follow him to Oriana in hopes of stealing his magic bag again. And later, after Felix escapes from Wax Circus, they join Felix on his quest to stop the Duke of Zill. Next we come to Felix's new friend, Mr. Pym, voiced by Peter Newman, whom I remember from three Rankin Bass properties like The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, along with Thundercats and Silverhawks. This guy is the first character whom Felix meets in the land of Zill and he's in charge of finding new things for Wax Circus. In my eyes, despite the fact that he betrays Felix in the swamps, I find Pym to be a pretty memorable and likable character due to him being a guide for Felix throughout his quest. And the fact that he's mistreated by Wack makes Pym a very sympathetic character. 
Also to note, I think Pym's design makes him sort of like a mix of Yosemite Sam and the Lorax, and his name kind of reminds me of a pirate with the same name from Fisher Price's Great Adventures Pirate Ship CD-ROM game. Next up is Princess Oriana, voiced by Marbury Stewart, whom you folks might remember from Katie Caterpillar and Ninja Scroll. In the beginning of the movie, Oriana's kingdom is being attacked and invaded by her uncle, the Duke of Zill, and his Cylinder Army, with her Minister Grumper's help, by the way. And after getting captured, she has been kept prisoner at Wack Lazardi Circus, where she was forced to dance during every show. To me, while Oriana is very innocent and tender-hearted, she's extremely clueless due to her disbanding her nation's entire army and believing that she need only rely on the people to fight back. Plus, I find it pretty interesting that Oriana's father had entrusted her with the royal secrets like time and dimension travel and the location of the Book of Ultimate Power. Also, Oriana has magical tears capable of becoming sentient and performing tasks when she is in desperate need. Plus, before getting captured by the cylinders, Oriana had hoped to use the Dements Porter in order to escape to another dimension and find a hero or a dark stranger to save the kingdom. Also, even though she didn't really expect that her hero was a talking black cat, I think she's very sweet, and I like that she shows great faith in Felix. And I think the parts where Oriana dances inside a bubble is really lovely, and the music that accompanies it is very enchanting. Next is Wack Lazardi, the crooked humanoid lizard ringmaster of the Fantastic Circus in the Land of Zill, who happens to be the second character voiced by Peter Newman. Yeah, I forgot to mention that he voices three characters in this movie. Anyway, Wax serves as a secondary antagonist of the film, and he's a high-level minion of the Duke of Zill, who lords over his subjects in a manner of a rich and corrupt businessman, and he imprisons anyone that doesn't do as he said or could live up to his high standards. Plus, to me, Wack is an absolute bully, and I agree with Felix that he really is a wacko. Also, I think Wack can be very dangerous due to him having a couple cylinders as his guards, and he uses his living scepter as a whip. Finally, we come to Oriana's evil uncle, the Duke of Zill, character number three, voiced by Peter Newman. A long time ago, the Duke was a scientist who disagreed with the pacifistic views that the kingdom held. After a laboratory accident that left him disfigured, he rebuilt his body into a mechanical shell. For attempting to seize the royal secrets of their ancestors' high technology, the Duke was banished to the land of Zill, where he plotted revenge, as well as gaining allegiance from the strange creatures of Zill, who helped him build a robotic army of cylinders and cubes. However, his real master plan, aside from conquering his niece's kingdom, is to find the royal secrets contained in the Book of Ultimate Power, which is revealed to be truth, love, and wisdom, much the Duke's shock. To me, the Duke of Zill, while not having a lot of screen time, is a very formidable tyrant, but he is also rather comical at times, due to him bullying his minions and flying into a rage. Plus, he's kind of like a mix of Darth Vader from the Star Wars franchise and Mysterio from the Spider-Man comics. And now on to my final words. Overall, Felix the Cat the Movie isn't really that bad of a film. Sure, it may have several flaws, due to a few parts being rushed, silly, random, and unnecessary. But those are several reasons why I enjoy it. Plus, the hand-drawn animation for the time is good. A few of the songs are pretty catchy, 
the main character, Felix, is a really zany and good-hearted hero. The characters whom he meets on his adventure are pretty strange, as he describes, with the exception of Princess Oriana, who is very sweet, innocent, responsible, and a faithful character. The Duke of Zill is a very power-hungry, hot-tempered, and intimidating villain, and I think the voice acting is great, especially with the talents of David Colin and Peter Newman. And I think this is another movie that I would label in the underrated category. Now, I'm not sure if it can still be sold on DVD these days, but if you'd like to see this movie for yourselves, look no further than YouTube. And I think you folks, along with your children, will have a good time once you see it. Also, now that Felix is owned by DreamWorks and Universal, I hope that Felix will receive the big screen animated film that he deserves soon. I mean, if Mr. Peabody and Sherman can get their own movie back in 2014, surely Felix can. Anyway, I give this movie a rating of 91% out of 100. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to join me for my next blog, where I look at a movie from the late 1990s starring the most famous caballero ever. Mustang Power. <laughs>